uh, an excellent recording, recording in progress. Um, an excellent uh, steward of computing for mankind. Um, we, I got to meet many years ago. Uh, but Dr. Smar received his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a PhD in physics from uh, UT Austin. Uh, his thesis was entitled The Structure of General Relativity with Numerical Illustration, the Collision of Two Black Holes, which I didn't know about. I actually downloaded it and going to read it, Dr. Smar. Uh, he is now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Distinguished Professor Emeritus, Department of Computer Science Engineering, Jacobs School of Engineering, UC San Diego. The founding director emeritus of the, at Cal, California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, and the founding director emeritus of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, thank you again for coming. I can't wait to hear your talk. Well, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, I'm going to take you through what has uh, been building up actually uh, for 20 years, but most recently in the last seven years. Uh, that is a very different sort of resource than your traditional supercomputer center, although those are engaged in it, as are the clouds, as we'll see. Um, it's a really distributed community owned and supported um, infrastructure, cyber infrastructure that enables you to do uh, big data computing and in machine learning and AI increasingly. Uh, and it's available for free to uh, any of you who would like to be engaged. Um, so I'll give you some ideas about what it is, how it came to be, and then some applications and how you can get involved. The um, uh, the way this started was, gosh, uh, about 12 years ago. Um, Department of Energy, uh, ESnet, realized that with the large amount of data on campus and the rise of optical networks, we needed to be able to have on campuses for researchers a separate uh, network that was uh, much more uh, powerful for research as opposed to just the commodity internet. And they came up with this questionable title, Science DMZ, uh, demilitarized zone, I guess. Uh, the idea was uh, that it had uh, using uh, PCs that were dedicated as data transfer nodes. Uh, it had uh, a specific network architecture for security. And then you may have heard of Personar, which is one of the measurement techniques. Well, that came out of all this. Um, the interesting thing is, as I've seen for um, probably 40, 40 years, the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation work closely together on these major developments. And so amazingly, and many of you may have actually gotten these grants, the National Science Foundation started up its campus cyber infrastructure program and has made over 340 awards um, across all 50 states and territories for campuses to establish these DMCs. Well, by 2015, it was clear to me that the next logical step was to use the pre-existing regional optical networks that are crisscrossed across the country to interconnect these campuses so that you could have a distributed uh, DMZ. And we happen to be in California, I'm at UC San Diego, where uh, uh, Scenic, uh, the California Research and Education Network already interconnected all of these uh, campuses. Now you can see in blue, those were all campuses that had already gotten one of these NSF awards to set up a DMZ on their campus. So I got together with uh, Berkeley and um, uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center and uh, my colleagues here at uh, UC San Diego and put in a proposal to NSF called the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, and that was funded starting in October uh, of 2015. Uh, it has continued. In fact, it just ended uh, last October as we finished building out. And from the beginning, we had in this uh, PRP, the Pacific Research Platform, we also had uh, partners in Hawaii and Montana State, and then in, in Chicago, and then Amsterdam, actually. Well, the first thing we did was figure out what, if you've got data, research data, for instance, that you want to analyze 
or you want to share, you need somewhere to put it. And you, uh, we realized that by continuing this process that we've done for many years, which is to work on the commodity technology, because every year, because there are hundreds of millions of people that have that buy PCs, that means that it gets cheaper and faster without us spending any money. We just ride that. And so that's how come we use personal computers. And it's also available to anybody on any of your campuses. So this is a standard PC, rack-mounted PC. You can put up to eight gaming NVIDIA GPU cards in the back of it, and now it becomes a machine learning uh, tool. Uh, and you have up to several hundred terabytes of rotating storage. Well, in the front end of it, we put a network interface card that can do 10, 40, or 100 gigabit per second transfer. And then on our national research platform website, which I urge you all to go and spend some quality time at, uh, if you want to learn how to get on this thing, we, for instance, have the actual specs. So you can literally just order one of these uh, and download it on your, uh, into your campus and get going. Um, uh, and, you know, in California, we have a long history of the, uh, you know, the getting in the VW microvan and, and going on uh, a road trip. So we just loaded up the back of Tom's van with uh, Tom Defani's van with these PCs and drove around to the various campuses and work with them to rack mount them. And that's literally how we, we got it all going. Um, and you can see here are some of our staff as well as the people at these different campuses. Uh, and that was in 2018 and 2019. And of course, for many of them, we drop ship them like just uh, Clemson or, or uh, uh, Florida A&M uh, most recently we've done. Um, uh, so that you can hook in to your regional optical network. Well, what we didn't appreciate was coming was uh, a real game changer from Google uh, in that if you think about what the cloud is, it's a set of PCs that are interconnected by optical fiber. So in a way, what we set out to do was the same, but for academics, run by academics, not a corporate uh, cloud. And what Google had to do, you know, and when people do a search, Google does a billion of those a day on, on its optically connected PCs in the cloud. Well, it, it had to be completely automated. So they came up with software originally called Borg that uh, was able to containerize uh, software and then execute it across um, the the cloud and so uh, docker for instance many of you may be familiar with is one of the ways that you containerize but you put your application in a sort of generic software container and then kubernetes which google developed as this orchestration software uh, to move containers across its uh, optically connected pcs um, uh, and and then execute them this we just simply adopted because Google made it open source. I mean, this is one of the greatest um, gifts of corporate America to mankind uh, in history. Uh, I mean, think about the thousands of super brilliant Google engineers it took to perfect this and develop it. And then they just gave it away, made it open source so we could all use it. It's quite amazing. And what it means is, of course, once you containerize your, your application, you can zoom right out into the, any of the three commercial clouds because they all adopted it instead of coming up with their own idea. And by now, three quarters of the Fortune 500 companies all use it. So if you have any students who want a job after they graduate, it would be really good for them right now to figure out how to containerize their software and use Kubernetes. Well, your training wheels are the national research platform. Uh, this is all, of course, open source to the Cloud Native uh, Foundation. So Kubernetes is this open source way to automate deployment, scaling, and managing of containerized applications. But what is really cool, since most of you are going to want to do this on data that you, you have or data you've downloaded, uh, there's something called Rook, which is also open source, <clears throat> that uh, 
runs under Kubernetes and manages the data. And that data can be files, it can be block, it can be object storage. And Ceph is one of the most widely used. Ceph came out of uh, Santa Cruz, again, open source uh, data storage. So those, so Rook runs under Kubernetes and Rook orchestrates Ceph. So, so in other words, as Kubernetes is orchestrating the software containers, uh, Rook is orchestrating the storage of the data that those applications are going to run on. And this is across the entire distributed system. You don't have to go and remote log on. When I was a child, I had to learn how to remote log on to remote computers to use that remote computer. Those days are gone as long as, you know, like assembly code. Uh, what Now the whole thing's automated. Well, what that lets us do, and we, and when by us, there's me, Tom Defani, and 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 a couple of SDSC employees, and then Frank uh, Wertheim, who's director of SDSC. That's it for the whole world that runs this thing, and and that's the whole point. As you automate, you don't need all of these uh, sysadmins that that cost a lot of money uh, because we're using software to automate it. Uh, we actually have these storage pools on campuses organized not only across the country, but in the Pacific uh, on, Guam and, on Guam and Hawaii, um, so that the speed of light means that once you put your data in one of these Ceph pools, um, it acts as if it's just local to you. And that gives the best performance. And it lets you do your compute jobs close to your storage data. Well, the next NSF grant came along. We rewrote it as people began to talk more about machine learning over the last five years. We put together uh, another NSF proposal to bring um, 256 GPUs and put them in these Fiona's and then populate that out on the PRP. And we took these 10 campuses to get started. We, and we we really literally went to those campuses, found who their machine learning faculty were, got them to write us up paragraphs on how they would use this for machine learning, and essentially bootstrapped up what has become the major application on the NLP, which is machine learning on uh, on data. Now um, this is again the original scenic grant. We got uh, this is California, but we linked into NCAR uh, and to uh, Chicago with the MREN regional network and up to the Pacific Northwest Gigapop and then out to Hawaii. So that was the original one. But then we wrote another proposal called Towards the NRP, uh, which was started in um, 2018. And what that did is allowed us to move this idea across the country. So we connected in the Texas Learn regional network the Great Plains network, which has become very, very active, as you'll see, um, and then NizerNet and Kinber in the Northeast, uh, and Internet2 uh, became a partner, uh, and the map you see behind you, behind this map, is the quilt map, and the quilt is the set of all the optical regional networks across the country, so you have to go back to when we were starting all this stuff, and I remember in 1985, after they, uh, you know, I wrote this unsolicited proposal in 83 to set up what became the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And that, along with Sid Karen's uh, unsolicited proposal to set up SDSC, kick-started the NSF supercomputer program. Well, the first thing they did was to hook them together in what was called, with a network called NSFNet. The, the, the back plane, the big pipes between the new NSF supercomputer centers in 86, NSFnet, its bandwidth was 56 kilobits, kilobits per second, the same as a dial-up modem. That was the big pipe across the country connecting supercomputers. You know, now we're at 100 billion bits per second on the optical network connecting this thing. So, you know, I've lived through, so I can't even count how many orders of magnitude you know, of, this, of this evolution. And yet what we really have is the fossils all the way across the country from the regional networks that all started up after NSFNet. In fact, NSF funded a lot of the, those, and they're still here today. So 
It's really important for those of you who are in campuses to know what regional optical network you're connected to because they're, they are really the organizing principle behind this distributed fabric of the NRP. Now, NSF uh, most recently, right in the middle of it right now from 2021 to 26, um, uh, funded another proposal. This one, Frank was the PI of, and Tom Defani was a co-PI of, and I was not on, on this one. But it set up a uh, what is called a prototype of the National Research Platform with three big centers at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which has become a real uh, hotbed for the Midwest, a real center of excellence and support, and then the Massachusetts Green HBC Center. Uh, and they brought in a lot more, not just of GPUs, but also FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. Those are becoming the next big thing after GPUs for machine learning and where you download uh, software into the firmware of, of, of the FPGA. So there are a bunch of those that you can now work on uh, through the PNRP. And then for some years, um, the NSF and others have supported what Frank Wertheim is executive director for before he became uh, also SDSC director, and that's the open science grid. And what this does is supports a lot of what are called high throughput computing um, that Condor uh, uses. Uh, and this is uh, connects, uh, uh, you know, clusters across the country, not just PCs, but clusters, and has over 200,000 Intel cores, CPU cores, um, uh, and is uh, the Open Science Grid has now been also integrated with the PRP. Uh, and so putting it all together, the National Research Platform is really just the um, federation of all of this work uh, now going back to 2015. And Frank Wertheim, uh, is the leader of this national research platform. Uh, and the PRP has now transformed into a subset of, of, of that. So the NRP will go forward now for a number of years. Um, and it's, and of course, got the director and staff of the San Diego Supercomputer Center now to support it. Well, where are we? Well, with all those Fiona's out there, we're uh, with all those. Uh, PCs, we're now over a thousand of 1200 GPUs, almost 20,000 CPU cores, and about 10,000 terabytes, uh, all interconnected uh, by uh, internet to the Quilt and Scenic in California. And this system is what we call Nautilus. It's a multi institutional hypercluster, effectively, of these PCs uh, that acts as one coherent distributed system. And I'm, uh, these slides will be available to you. I'll send them off to um, uh, be posted. Uh, so, and I, I put a lot of this stuff in here so that those of you who want to follow up and learn a little bit more about it will have this as a reference. But you can see here that in each of these, first of all, notice that as we built it out, we had a, a one really important overriding consideration. We wanted to be as inclusive as possible. We wanted to bring in as many minority serving institutions. We wanted to bring in as many of the EPSCOR states, the NSF uh, 28 states out of 50 that are received the least NSF funding. So in other words, to make this as, as broadly available uh, as, as possible. And so you can see, for instance, um, uh, uh, these green are all EBSCOR states. Uh, the uh, blue are uh, from Florida A&M, which is the, one of the highest ranked, uh, perhaps the highest ranked uh, historically black college and universities in, in Florida. Uh, UIC, minority serving. All of these are um, uh, uh, part or are, are have these Fiona's and then this tells you the number of GPUs and then the over scenic, over Great Plains network, over ORNET, over MREN, over NISERNET, over Florida Lambda Rail. Those are all those regional networks that connect uh, those campuses uh, where these are all located. Uh, furthermore, here's the same thing 
uh, and I won't go through it in any detail, but for where all of that storage is, uh, 10 uh, petabytes uh, of storage is, is distributed. Okay, so if this is what is your appetite and you wanna say, how do I get in coach? Um, the way I would say to do it is just go to the National Research Platform website and you will see uh, this is the uh, Nautilus uh, page, and it under here, the Nautilus documentation, that takes you through, okay, how do I personally log on? And that if you're on a campus, you use CI log on as your authentication. So we just adopted the authentication you already are using on your campus. That's all you do. You log on. And then you make a namespace for yourself, a project namespace. That's a Kubernetes notion. Um, and by the way, we're up to um, over a thousand namespace projects on this <laughs> national research platform. So, you know, you got a lot of other folks that have, are out there already. Now, why that's useful is you see this red button, click for matrix chat. So this is an actual useful social network. Um, it's, there's no cat videos, I'm sorry to say, uh, but uh, this is, uh, you become a part of that community when you join in here. So if you have a question, like I'm trying to do this and I don't understand how come it's not working, you just chat that out to Matrix and whoever, whosever shoulder is closest to the wheel, they push on it and give you an answer. So in other words, it's the community is the consultant. All of you who become part of this are then consultants. And so everybody helps everybody. This is what I love about it. Uh, it's a very different thing than, you know, you're used to we're paid consultants and uh, they're too busy and everything. The idea is that um, uh, we're all in the same swimming in the same pool. So let's all help each other. Uh, and then you can just click on this. You'll have all of those uh, thousand namespaces. You can look through how they, you, it, once you have it in, you can have users. So you can put your graduate students on it. You know, all you have to do is authenticate and then you, you can use it, right? So it's, I mean, it's way simpler than a supercomputer center where you have to write an allocation and then you have to wait till the quarter to get the uh, did you make it or not? And did they give you as much time as you want? Yeah, just get in and swim. Okay. Now, uh, I recommend for any of you who are interested in doing this, the first thing you do is go watch this 10-minute video that I uh, helped uh, I directed uh, last December and that Berkeley's uh, excellent communication team uh, put together. And it takes you through all I've said so far, uh, except it has even better uh, graphics uh, to that of where all these things are, but it gives you three applications. And these are three of our big applications that emerged over the last few years. Uh, and I'll just take you quickly through just to give you a sense of what can be done. So one of the things that we were kind of unexpected <clears throat> is um, NSF has a one of the great observatories on the planet at the South Pole. And this is to look for neutrinos. Neutrinos, for those of you who don't do astrophysics, uh, are massless, marvelous massless particles, not quite, uh, that can go through 17 light years of lead without scattering once. So they're so-called ghost particles, but they come from some of the most energetic events in the universe. Uh, and um, so they, there is a uh, under, uh, you'll see some beautiful videos of how they lower these photo detectors down into this ice uh, that they drill these holes uh, on the South Pole. And then they, uh, what they're looking for is when a neutrino finally does scatter, because there are a zillion of them, so even though there's, they scatter very rarely, there's so many of them that it occasionally will hit an atom and it'll cause a photon uh, burst and, and those go into the photo detectors. So they need to go and calculate using uh, GPUs uh, a, a zillion parallel photon trajectories to, uh, to understand how to figure out where in the sky this came from when it hits a certain, when it shoots through a certain set. And you'll see these beautiful videos uh, 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 that they took down there. 
Uh, well, it turns out that, um, that we have it set up. So if you are all not using up all the GPUs, we make them available for national strategic projects like this one. And it's gone in and grabbed up the background GPUs. It used as much as 50% of our 1200 GPUs, but without getting in the way of any users. So as soon as a user wants those GPUs, it goes and backs off automatically. Uh, but this means we can be both efficient, but also we can be very timely in, in response to your needs. There's some gorgeous videos in here of how we use, we, we will take data like we, uh, Tom Defani um, uh, went over to Egypt and actually uh, took uh, one of our uh, cameras that could do 3D um, uh, uh, video and he uh, captured this beautiful uh, uh, archeological site in, in Egypt. Well, we put that data out on the NRP and then the optical networks connect them into the virtual reality caves, one at Merced and one at UCSD. All those caves, of course, are run by GPUs. But the cool thing is we realize that there's not people in the cave looking at visual stuff most of the time. So we took all those GPUs and added them into the NRP and so they're used for machine learning for people like you all over the campuses when nobody else is sitting in the cave at Merced or, 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 or uh, San Diego. Uh, but you'll, you'll see how this idea of using data out on the national research platform and then pulling it into virtual reality, which you could do into headsets, for instance, like the new Apple headset, uh, all interconnected by regional optical networks. So anyway, I, I think you'll really enjoy seeing this. Now, uh, this one is going to be more and more important. And for those of you on the East Coast who recently uh, had to deal with the smoke uh, coming from the Canadian wildfires, uh, you're uh, beginning to get what we live with out here in California. Uh, and it's going to become more and more like this as climate change continues. So we have one of the top groups here at uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center that LK Altenis runs. She's the chief data science officer at SDSC. And there's a workflow that takes data streaming in from uh, real-time meteorological sensors that we've put all over the mountains in uh, Southern California, uh, together with weather forecasts. That all comes in through the NRP and Scenic into this workflow. But then we have all over Southern California, uh, San Diego County, Southern California, we have the 3D landscape and all of its, um, uh, what is the, um, you know, is it burnable or is it, is it uh, street, is it whatever, uh, at a very high resolution. And then when a wildfire breaks out, we have all of the drones and the helicopters and satellites and everything that bring in the fire parameter. That goes into something called Farsight. All that is run on, on the SDSC supercomputer, and then that comes out of the workflow into a public facing uh, fire map that shows the extent of where the fire is, where it's going to, and all the satellite imagery. Uh, and that has been used by as many as 800,000 citizens during the major wildfires we've had in the last few years. Um, now, that would be enough for most people, but it turns out. Uh, as they say, there's more. And the thing that has most been heartening to me is while you hear everybody yakking about um, machine learning and AI and is it going to, you know, become take over the world and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of faculty and students who are just actually doing uh, innovations that are driving uh, machine learning. And, and this is now something like, I would say, 90% of the namespaces that are the larger users of the NRP are now in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. For instance, you know, the AI is embedded in robots and in a lot of different ways, including self-driving cars and so forth. So there's a lot of how do you train um, a robot to recognize the world and to manipulate it, right? 
Um, well, there's essentially you start by making a digital twin of the real world of virtual reality. And then you have the robot interacting with all of this. And this is how, for instance, you drive through a virtual copy of the traffic world with a self-driving car. Uh, so this is just one of our researchers, faculty at UCSD. And it's just training. They, 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 do, they do these specialist learning um, uh, that are neural nets. And then th they, they do hundreds of those. And then each specialist is trained in millions of environmental variants. Uh, this uses about 10,000 GPU hours per run. This is one faculty member at UCSD and their grad students, okay? Um, here's a totally, this is, by the way, in my department <laughs> in CS. Here's a completely different faculty member. You know, if you're going to be building uh, the metaverse, uh, you got to be able to take the physical objects in the in the physical world and make 3D versions of them that are highly accurate. And so here's an example where you just take a whole bunch of, of uh, you know, 2D images like with your phone. And then there are these new things that are essentially taking machine learning uh, into the workflow that combines those 2D images to make a, a, a realistic 3D uh, image. And these are called NERFs, uh, neural radiance fields. Uh, and they're um, essentially putting neural networks into uh, visualization. And, and, and you may not have heard of NERFs. However, Time has heard of them. New York Times has heard of them. And Meta is making a huge investment in this to populate the metaverse with objects. And so the this is, you know, just like on the very cutting edge of visualization. Uh, and, and if you think about how we're gonna, how we're you know moving into this digital twin of the world and how we're gonna, I mean, you know, all we got is these 2D little, you know postage stamps of each other, right? We're not in the same room in 3D as avatars and interacting with real objects and stuff like that. You know, that's where we're going very quickly. And this is one of the major tools. So that's just another example of a, of a university professor and students that are, and all these students, of course, are getting an extra zero or two on their starting salaries as a result of having been in this project, as yours will as well. So how much of the NRP did, did that little project do? Well, here is um, 2022 from January to July to December. And this up at the top is 120 GPUs being kept active 24 hours a day. And this is one namespace by one professor and their students on the NRP. Turns out it was the third most used uh, Nautilus namespace uh, in uh, last year. Okay, so how do you get it involved? How, you know, what can you do on your own campus? It's great for UCSD or you know other places that have had a supercomputer for thirty years and you know have enculturated how to do all this stuff. I'll tell you what I am most excited about is universities that don't have a history of high performance computing that are learning how to bootstrap themselves up. Let me give you a couple of examples. Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, they're right up north east of, of San Diego. They formed completely independent of me. They, they formed a what they called an HPC academic technology and innovation group there. Now, this is a pretty much, a, this is a California State University. It's a four-year, you know, undergraduate education. They're not uh, a PhD granting institution. So they're typical of an awful lot of hundreds of other campuses out there. Well, go to their website, which I give you here, 
And you'll see that they just formed a group that had like one assistant professor and a couple of academic professionals from the Inter Information Technology Services on the campus. They formed, uh, let's educate our faculty and students about various kinds of high performance computing, including how do you make Jupyter notebooks, which is a lingua franca. The, this is what you do if you're in data science these days. Uh, and Jupyter Notebooks, if you're not doing that, that's the first thing to get going uh, is because those things uh, you can put in, they're like an electronic notebook, but you have your software, your data, your visualization, and then you just give the URL of that notebook to somebody else and they, they have it and it's live and they can then go in and change it and all of a sudden they're doing something. So it's this huge sharing opportunity. Um, and then access is the, the new exceed from NSF that uh, is, uh, so this is sort of a gateway to how do you find if you want like supercomputer center type things, but also uh, OSG, the Open Science Grid or the National Research Platform. And so these four people or so basically then uh, uh, got their students to start doing a faculty to do projects. This faculty showcase, they asked me to come in and give a talk like this. Um, and, and you can see here, this is, uh, all these are different namespaces at San Bernardino over the years. As a result, they now, in the last 12 months, they have used more GPU hours than seven of the 10 UC campuses. I mean, you talk about David and Goliath. I mean, this is kind of nuts um, how they, and they did it all by themselves. I mean, it's just crazy. And it took four people on their campus to activate this whole thing. Now they're very good people. They're very dedicated to helping their other colleagues. But that's one of the, I think one of the, the prize examples uh, that has emerged from all this. Uh, now, the next thing I would say is, like I said, figure out what campus, what your regional optical network is. This is Jen Leisure, who has worked with us. Uh, she was uh, at the first um, National Research Platform workshop um, five years ago. Uh, she's the president and CEO of the Quilt. The Quilt is the organization of all the regional optical networks. And then Internet 2 is the national network that hooks together all of those uh, networks. Um, and here, for instance, this is just from February. Uh, they were, they had, uh, we had the fourth national research platform uh, meeting workshop here in San Diego last February. Uh, and uh, this is uh, her uh, giving the talk on, on building the NRP ecosystem with regional networks on their campuses that the regional networks connect. And so if you go to this slide link here, all the slides and videos of all of the presentations for the fourth NRP workshop are available to you. And then they had an article on how do you get your campus to hook through your regional network to be part of the NRP. So again, those are resources for you to get started. Let's just take one of those regional networks, the Great Plains Network. Uh, the University of Missouri, uh, I'm proud to say, as a as a uh, alma mater, uh, a Mizzou. Uh, uh, in fact, I spent my first 13 years from K through kindergarten through um, senior in college on that campus <laughs> from their lab school. And uh, but I'm so proud of them because uh, Grant Scott, uh, who uh, is a professor there, uh, he has built this high performance data intensive computing lab. Uh, and uh, he then was giving this talk at the Great Plains Network to all the other uh, uh, campuses that are connected by the Great Plains Network uh, on how to uh, use this. And he's someone you should have talked because he has built the kind of, pro, uh, the kind of uh, uh, programs on the campus for getting students involved in this. He's, he's, I would say, about the best in the country, that as far as from where I sit. Um, so I highly recommend it. Okay, talking about students, let me uh, get 
close to finishing up here, you might realize that it's a global competitive world and the United States is in a race for its life with other countries around the world on who is going to be able to develop AI and machine learning and train a national workforce fast enough to continue to enjoy the leadership that the United States has had since World War II. Uh, and you will be seeing up to $100 million for the federal government being put into this to have an inclusive uh, in, in engagement of all uh, campuses in this country, if not even the community colleges and the high schools. Uh, and so that NSF is gonna be, this is what the big tidal wave coming over the next five years from the NSF is gonna be, is, is to get everybody's hand in, in machine learning and AI. Um, and so uh, a few years ago, UCSD, th their IT services, said, well, why can't we just clone these Fionas into a, a rack just for instruction, just for our courses, so that the students who are taking courses in uh, statistical analysis, machine learning, whatever, work with the absolute industry standard software tools with the absolute best uh, tools, not hand-me-down stuff, not go use one GPU on your, if you happen to have one on your PC uh, at night, but, but scale out to hundreds of GPUs. And then that's why you're a student, an undergraduate. Now, when you get to your first job, you're going to have more experience than anybody in the company that just hired you. Well, this was an experiment with 124 of these GPUs. And here's the result. Going back, this is going back to 2017, and this is the fall, winter, spring, fall, winter, spring quarter. These are the number of courses that are using this resource. And we're talking about 30 courses in one campus with 4,000 students that have signed on and used this facility. Now, this is not shared with the NRP because at UCSD, there's some arcane rules about instructional stuff can't be the same as research stuff or something like that. But just to give you an example of what one campus is doing, are your students competitive with these students? If not, you need to get with the program. And so the question is, how do you do that? on your campus. Well, let me again go to a minority serving institution, San Diego State University across town. They saw this and Jerry Sheehan, who's their CIO said, well, we can do that, but I'll tell you what, we're gonna do one better. We're gonna, we don't have those archaic rules. We're gonna federate this with the NRP. The reason we do it is self-serving because when our students need to surge to get more GPUs, because we've made this part of the whole thing. They just transparently go out and grab however many they need to get their projects done. At the end of the quarter, he's already got several courses, computational engineering, astronomy techniques, and so forth, as well as research. But here's the deal. Because he makes it part of the NRP, he gets the system administration for free on his campus which means he can take the budget he would have been using and use that to help create more trainers on his campus instead of keeping the hardware and software going, right? So, I mean, we do all the security updates. We do all of the app software updates for everybody on the NRP automatically, which means that you really reduce your people cost on your campus to be part of this. And that's just started. Okay, let me find, let me just finish with about four slides. It, I guess, I, I mean, <laughs> I can't say I knew this was where this was going to go when we put this proposal together back in 2014, almost 10 years ago. But when we started, you remember, we only had six states. Remember, we had California, Hawaii, Montana, Chicago, Illinois. So there are 45 states that now have users 
We started with 19 campuses. There are now 135 campuses with users that have logged on to Nautilus. We started with nine minority serving institutions because there are a fair number in California. We're at 24 now. And we started with two of the NSF 28 EPSCOR states. We now have 20 that have users that are using it, including two territories and Washington, D.C. as well. And just to show you, I'm not blowing the smoke. I'll give you the actual names and numbers right here. So this is the where we started in 2015. Those are the only campuses that were involved. The green are minority serving institutions, the red are EPSCOR states. I can't get them all on one slide now. So I broke the United States into three sections, the West, the Midwest, and the East. Here are all of the West, including Nevada, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, in the Midwest. Again, you don't have to go through all this, but you can just notice that um, you know university. I didn't even know there was a University of Central Missouri, and I spent my life, uh, early life there. Um, I mean, you know, southeastern Louisiana University. Um, uh, these are not, you know, your top ten. Truman State. I didn't even know there was a Truman State uh, University. Uh, and and then on the East Coast, um, we have again uh, quite a bit. Uh, more of the EPSCOR states and the uh, minority serving uh, institutions. Um, uh, but, okay, this is a good start. <laughs> but, you know, we could use another 100 or two uh, campuses to add to this list over the next few years as Frank uh, Wertheim continues to uh, pilot the, the NRP. Um, so, I think I'll stop here. Um, I'll just say that, you know, we have been, uh, this goes back to this example from the second NRP, all the way along, uh, we came, this was where we came up with ideas to put mini Fiona's on some of the minority serving institutions just to get them started. And we had, um, uh, those were handed out uh, for free uh, to the people who were attending. We had speakers from uh, the minority serving institutions for the EPSCOR states and so forth. Um, it takes a huge, you know, a huge family uh, of collaborators to make something like this happen. Uh, so I'll just leave it with that. Uh, but I think we've got time for some questions if there are uh, any. Um, You can unmute and ask questions if you'd like, or we did have a question uh, regarding your GPU usage chart that uh, you had, um, I think it was Grafana maybe? Uh, maybe? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, that's The question was just, how did you get this GPU usage chart? So Grafana is a yes. software reporting tool. That's correct. And um, this is what I spend my, my quality time doing. <laughs> is, uh, Grafana is, again, a open source uh, tool. Um, it's really quite amazing. It, it keeps track of, um, let's just see here. I'm going to tempt fate by taking something that I haven't had set up ahead of time. Let's see, where's my Grafana chart? Okay, so let me stop sharing. And start sharing. Okay, so I'm now using, this is Grafana Live. Right. So... This is from uh, June of last year. You put in whatever time you want. This is just a UR, grafana.nrp minus nautilus.io. Um, and as I, uh, so, so this is time, okay? This is from uh, last June to uh, now. So this is one year. Um, and then uh, each of these uh, is, uh, is a namespace. So um, if I mouse over it, See the um, at the top is Ice Cube, and then Hao Su, who is the one I was showing you, mm -hmm. is 
the blue, and then below that is uh, a CMS ML. That means the, the Large Hadron Collider CMS detector data that they're doing machine learning on. And if you want uh, to go in and um, look at any of these, like let's take um, OSG Ice Cube, for instance. Oh, here, see down below, those are the active, the biggest uh, namespace users. So let's just click on OSG Ice Cube. And, and there it, there is, this is 600 GPUs over here. And it turns out that that's the, for some odd reason, January 6th, which I guess other things were happening uh, as well in our country. Um, the Grafana, we shifted to a different way of reporting. So I have to do, so I've got two, there's, there's, so that's the after January 6th and the other, and if I get this right, normally you don't have to do this, but um, just because we had a, a switch in the reporting system. Let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, so anyway, you can see that um, I'm switching back and forth, but say that I wanted to just look at what happened in the last 24 hours. Yay. Um, and so <laughs> that that is Ice Cube in the last 24 hours, okay, from 10 o'clock yesterday until now, Pacific time, and that's 200 GPUs. Uh, and let's see how my colleague in my department, how Sue, you know, has he been sleeping? Um, there he is. Uh, well, he's managed in the last 24 hours to keep 100 GPUs going. Um, and oh, by the way, this is completely open. Any of you can be looking at this if you want to any of your colleagues. So, uh, and it's all available off of the NRP website. Hey, Larry, so to be clear, so how much does it cost me to, to access the system as a Zero. U.S. researcher? Zero. It, it will take you uh, a few hours probably of your time to actually read the NRP website to figure out if you don't already know how to log on to your campus through CI Login to figure out how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> But so you got to put a little sweat equity in uh, of that level, but you don't have to write a proposal. You don't have to wait for an allocation committee. And there are a zillion people who are already there and will help you uh, get in there. It, I, it, I've aggregated people from all over the country on there and you can use Google too. You don't have to be CI log on as well. So yes, it's an correct. excellent place to be doing like hackathons and just distributed learning and research is it's perfect for it. Thank you for building this. It's affected my research and makes me mad. You made me mad though, because a lot of my students are getting jobs that are like, one guy got How a job three times my farm, past time. You know, <laughs> once they've seen NPR, I mean, NRP, I mean, it's, yeah. it's like, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> the good thing. The country thanks us, but. <laughs> Um, so Fang asked where we can find and download the PowerPoint file. We will send that out um, to this community, and we I believe we will also post it on the CARC website. Um, so uh, if you have not um, received it, you can um, send an email to me, uh, combsje at uc.edu, not University of California, but University of Cincinnati. And, um, but we'll, we'll make sure that everybody gets access to that. Um, we've got a lot of thank yous out of here for you on the chat. Um, uh, Jeremy Everett mentioned that Grant just got a grant to help connect more hardware to the NRP OSG. I guess that was through the NSF engines. That he did. And uh, that's a good example. I, I mean, that's why I think Scott, uh, Grant Scott is such a good, person to have because he has you know he's a young professor he he's mm -hmm. figured out 
how to um, use the you know use the NSF to get more resources, not just for MU. That's the thing I love about him. He's 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 reaching out to all of his fellow campuses and helping them along too. That's great. That's great. Um, somebody asked, uh, Carl asked, what would it take to get one more or all of the remaining quilt networks to participate in NRP? Well, uh, they all meet um, at least, I think, once or twice a year. They've been meeting uh, in February, for instance, at um, in La Jolla. At, at, um, in fact, they, they were meeting. They we timed the four NRP workshop to be start the day there's finished uh, in La Jolla. So they'd already be here. Um, uh, they're very active. Um, and, and, and the quilt is the umbrella organization of all the regional optical networks. So um, you just have to have your regional optical network uh, pay attention to what they've been being told all along, which is how to get involved with this. And the thing that's really seriously, what's in, what's important for the regional optical network, whoever your operator is, is to know that you want to do this because they need to be demand driven from the campuses. The campuses are paying the regional optical networks for that connectivity. This is a value added for the same amount of money you're already paying to be connected. So activate it, you know, uh, find out who is uh, on your, you know, who runs your local uh, 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 network and then tell them, hey, we want to be uh, hooked in here. How do you, can you help us? Can you give us materials, you know, et cetera? Well, we are out of time. I hate to say this because I bet everybody on here could listen and talk to you all day. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Smar. Um, we really appreciate it. And thanks, Alex, again for, for bringing this to our community. And I, I think you're going to see a little uptick of users probably on the, uh, on the NRP. So um, let us know if we can do anything for you um, as part of our our CARP community. We'll definitely yeah. spread the word. Yeah. Well, I think I think the CARP. I'll just end with that. The CARP, um, you know, you you should aggregate some of these um, um, talks, videos, and 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 um, other kind of um, um, starter kits uh, for your mm -hmm. members um, because that's what they're really for. Um, I mean, University of Cincinnati, I do believe, is uh, has users. <laughs> I think we do. I know. I'm going to have to find them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is it it is interesting. Um, I had a faculty member here uh, who had some brilliant uh, medical imaging stuff that they wanted to use this for, and and I, you know, went through it with them just literally this week, um, and how to hook on, and they said this is fantastic. It's going to change our whole research career. How come nobody knows about it? It's mm -hmm. the same old story with everything. Right? Yeah. Alex has been telling us about it. And I, we're, I, I, but you know, we don't have enough people in communication and there's too many channels and, but yeah, we got to do this. Yeah. Well, I think you can be a big help, Jake. I mean, putting yeah. your, putting the stuff up on your website, sending out things, having, when you have a meeting, you know, having a speaker like, like, like Scott Grant. Yeah, I will definitely be contacting him. Yeah, Grant Scott. I mean, he he is, um, uh, you know, that's that's what he was an invited speaker at the at the Great Plains Network, right? Because the Great Plains Network meeting was the campuses <laughs> come to that meeting that mm -hmm. are connected by the Great Plains Network, right? And so then they had that um, that talk and. Um, yeah. And then I think the other thing is to, when you get any of your members who have gotten on and, and, and are using it, make them, make heroes of them. I mean, you, you've got communication capability. Yeah. You know, or, or put up a list of, of campuses that are, you know, associated with you that have made it, you know, and, and, and then where are the rest of you? You know, here's some friends who can help. <laughs> that competition part does work actually <laughs> like well, why isn't why isn't my university on that list that's right but it's yeah. it's cooperation and collaboration yeah. uh that emerges from that competitive spirit yes it's a great community we're all in this together yes that's, we are yeah it's great and stronger as a result 
-hmm. All right. Well, thanks again. Hopefully we'll see you all and everybody on the call soon. And uh, if nothing else, we'll all be out in Portland, I think for, uh, or hopefully there are some free travel support um, uh, messages that have been going out. So if you have an interest in going to Perk 23 out in Portland and you don't have funding, uh, either let me know or or somebody. There's there's some great um, resources with the RCD Nexus is providing travel support. So look into it, and we'll all see you there. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks, Alex. See ya. Bye.